like this uh, that are out there of oh, extraterrestrial or a large uh, hairy creature with uh, arms that hang down uh, beside its, be you know, or down on its sides. I told him my name, and when I told him my name, he said he was called Cole. There's not anything from this earth that I'm not quite sure of. You're listening to the Strangeology Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Foran, and this is your place to explore the weird, strange, and unexplained. From cryptids and creatures, the paranormal, aliens and UFOs, forbidden knowledge, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, and more. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show, and thank you so much for hanging out today. Coming up on this edition is a conversation about the sinister side of the alien abduction phenomena and what the potential plans are that the intelligence behind it has in store for humanity. Well, spring is officially here as I'm recording this today, and I'm definitely here for it as I'm also trying to fight off getting bronchitis. So if you're wondering why my voice might sound a little bit scratchy, that's why. So things have been pretty busy here at Strangeology HQ as usual, and it's shaping up to be a big yard cleanup season this spring with lots to do, namely a mud pit next to my driveway that involved getting a car stuck the other week. Uh, that was largely due to me parking a car in the wrong spot. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> most of the snow is melted and the temperature is steadily warming up. I think there's maybe one or two days coming up where there's a chance of some snow, but that's what happens here in New England. And at this point, we're ready for spring, summer, and there's no stopping it now. Before I get started today, don't forget to put your podcasting apps onto auto-download so you never miss a new episode. And if you can leave a review on your preferred podcasting app, it's super helpful for the show and very much appreciated. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for more content and updates from me. If you're wondering where the show is, I'm always posting over there. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. I also have X and Threads, but I'm not really too active on those platforms. But if you want to follow me on those as well, definitely do. And I also have a blog over on my website, strangeology.com, if you want to read articles. And just putting it out there, again, if you are a writer and you like to write about the strange and unexplained, the 14 world, the paranormal, cryptids, ancient mysteries, conspiracies, that kind of thing, definitely get in touch because it would be nice to have some help. My email is info at strangeology.com and you can get in touch with me there. And if you ever have any other feedback for the show, constructive thoughts, or you want to share stories of your own encounters with the strange and unexplained for a future installment of a listener's stories episode, definitely send me a DM over on my social media, or you can send me an email at info at strangeology.com. And just a quick reminder that I will be at the International Cryptozoology Conference in Portland, Maine on Saturday, April 27th. I'm going to have a vendor's table there, and I'll be slinging merch. Tickets are on sale now, which I'll have a link for that in my show notes, and I'll probably put it on my link tree as well, and hopefully get to connect with a lot of you out there who like to come to conferences. So if you're in Maine or New England in general, or like to travel to these kinds of events, you should definitely come out and stop by my table and say hello. I usually post beforehand on Instagram a floor map of the vendors area. Usually these kinds of events will provide that kind of thing. Uh, so you'll know exactly where I am and other vendors are. Uh, I also post it on my Discord, uh, which if you haven't joined yet, definitely do. Uh, it's discord.io forward slash strangeology for some extra content and conversation with other Fortean enthusiasts. So definitely come out to this event on April 27th. It's going to be a great time. All right. Well, that's enough for the front portion of the show. Why don't we get into the main event? On this edition of the show, 
I brought on a brand new guest, an author and an alien abduction experiencer named Karen Wilkinson. Karen's story is a harrowing one that looks at the phenomena through the lens of her own experiences, showing her that these beings, whoever or whatever they are, may not have the best intentions for humanity. And just as a a warning on the subject, there's going to be discussion about sexual encounters and assault by these otherworldly entities. And if that's something that's hard to hear about for you, I would suggest skipping past those parts. Uh, It's not touched on for a long time. It's a, kind of a, a, a brief touch on it, but just as a, a warning before we start. All right, well, this is going to be a very interesting conversation, so let's go. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. Joining me today is Karen Wilkinson. For a little background, Karen is the author of the book Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest, which we'll be getting into. She's also a regular writer and contributor to Ellie Marzulli's monthly newsletter. Karen is also a wife, a mother, and a grandmother, and used to work in the software industry for several years before leaving to raise her family. Now, for as early as she can remember, she's gone through the alien abduction experience by non-human intelligences, alien entities, potentially hundreds of times throughout her life, along with having regular sightings of UFOs as well. These experiences have shown her that these beings, whoever or whatever they are, may not have the best intentions for humanity. So welcome to the show, Karen. So glad to have you on today. Uh, How are you doing? Hi, Jeff. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored to be here with you today. I'm doing well. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Yeah. Now, um, so you've been dealing with interactions with these entities, and I guess we'll just, you know, we'll get right into this uh, Mm -hmm. your whole life. What's your earliest memory of encountering these things? Right. Um, You know, I was taken from my very earliest memories. Um, There are memories I have of being afraid of certain members of my family because they looked so much like the Nordic beings that I was already encountering at like two, three years old. Even though I didn't have vivid memories of the actual abduction scenario, I had vivid memories of the entities that I was in contact with. So I don't remember a time in my life when they weren't taking me. Well, my memories really started to solidify around five or six years old, which is common for people. That's when we really have those clear memories. Um, That's when the memories of the actual abduction scenarios um, begin for me. Um, From as early as I can remember, they were just always there, always taking me from from my early stage. Wow. That's uh, definitely... Uh, a disconcerting thing. Um, Did you think they were like nightmares at first or uh, was it clear that these were flesh and blood entities that were coming in and interacting with you? Yeah, it was very clear that that's what was happening to me from a very young age. I mean, you know, back then we're talking the sixties and seventies, there weren't movies or books about this. No one was talking to a five-year-old child about this type of thing. I didn't have the words to describe who or what they were, but they were very real, very much in my presence. And these things were very much happening. And when it starts at that young an age, it becomes just a part of your life and a part of your life that eventually you begin to accept because not not willingly, but, you know, it, it became such a difficult thing for me because I didn't have the words to say. I didn't know how to describe to people what was happening to me. I could say the little ones that were coming to get me, that they were taking me off the bed, that they were taking me out the window. I was outside, I was in there, whatever. You know, most adults are going to think that's a dream, a nightmare. They're not going to understand the words I'm using. None of it's going to make sense. So it was very difficult to communicate from a very early age. And um, to get to the point where I had a breakdown when I was about six years old, um, where my mom had to come get me from school because they found me 
huddled in the corner of a bathroom stall, just holding my knees and rocking. And I think that's the point where I had just kind of given up and given in. And, you know, she took me to a doctor and they noted that there were marks and bruises and strange things on my body. But in that, you know, I was trying to tell them they keep taking me, they're bothering me, they're touching me. No one understood what I was talking about. And um, he said, well, she's young. She'll forget. Don't worry about it. And at that point, I realized I I have no one. There's no one is going to understand what's going on. And I think that's the point where I just kind of split it and allowed myself to live life here and let that happen over there. You know what I mean? And just let my mind allow myself not to have to process it all day, every day, but just kind of disconnect from it. Um, but it was very real. And the memories were extremely extremely tangible and ex- the things that were happening were very real yeah what a, a a difficult and traumatic thing to go through at, at such a young age yeah, yeah. and so, it's not that i mean kids go through tough things all the yes. time we do our children in this world still to this day is is horrific so you know our little minds when we're young are built to protect us in certain ways from certain things and you know that is that was i was grateful for that yes yes so you've written this book, uh, Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. Can you describe um, what this is about? Sure. Yeah, the book is um, chronicles basically what happened throughout my lifetime, um, what these entities did, who and what I feel they are, and some details that are more easy to write about than to talk about sometimes because some of it gets a little bit dark. I wouldn't call it a scary book. Some people are a little afraid to read it. I would not say that. There are some sections where I say, if you're not comfortable with this type of thing, go ahead and skip this part, you know, because some of it's a little bit uncomfortable for some readers. But, um, and it, you know, it could be not to overuse the word triggered, but it could be a bit triggering for some people. Um, But it was meant to help people. And it was meant to say, look, this is happening. This is real. You're not alone. You can stop it this is what I think they are. And this is, you know, what's happened to me throughout a lifetime. And just to, to share the truth of what's really going on out there from the perspective of someone who is just a normal everyday person in society. You know, I'm just your neighbor, the girl next door. I'm nobody special. I'm no one different. But what's happened to me has happened to so many other people. I mean, Jeff, I talked to probably at least one person every day who's gone through this one new person. Um, That's how many people reach out to me. How many people I meet, how many people I talk to. It is not an unusual thing. It's unusual to talk about it because in our society, we've been trained that you don't talk about these things. They're too woo. They're too out there. It's not okay. You know, and, and then of course the powers that be have created this, this veil over that says, well, you're a crazy person or a psychotic delusion. And they've got people out there all over the place touting that psychotic delusion, you know, parroting that message, which is horrible because not just for me, but for the people I talk to and, you know, other people who've gone through this, that's like victim shaming. That's horrible. It's, it's, you know, saying that the trauma and the pain that we've gone through isn't real. And uh, that's unfortunate that there are people doing that. But yes. we have people we are supportive and that makes up for that. So thank you. Right. Yes, of course. Of course. We're, we're trying to get the, the truth out there for sure. Uh, so obviously you were, you were inspired to write this book uh, based on your life experiences. Uh, what do you have any, any goals or uh, things that you're hoping can be accomplished by sharing your experiences? Uh, you mentioned that people do reach out to you, but is there anything further that you're hoping that this can can do. Right. Yeah, I do. There are a lot of goals, I think, associated with this. You know, I didn't expect to write this book. Um, And it all kind of happened after I went through what I call my near life experience. Most people call it a near death experience, but had a very um, traumatic near death experience. And I went through and we can speak about that later if you're interested, but not to get off track. I went through PTSD therapy after that. And that therapy helped me deal with the, this lifetime of of abductions and and just the pain and the torture and the PTSD that came from that. Once I was able to really be able to deal with it and speak about it, 
Then I felt led to L.A. Marzulli, and it just was all happened so randomly that we were put together and never expected to share my story. But I shared my story with him thinking, you know, this is going to help somebody because if they know they're not alone and they know that there's a way to stop it, then if someone hears that and one person hears that, then I feel that's good. I've done something that is going to help somebody, you know, and so that was the initial goal with it, honestly. And after the movie, I started talking to so many people that I really felt led to write and the urge to write it was so strong. And it's very easy to write just truth and memories that just flows out, you know. So I wrote the book and L.A. loved it and he published it and um, L.A. Marzulli. And um, from there, it's provided a platform where people can reach out to me, but they don't and they can read the book or they can watch the movie. I'm in his fourth movie on the UFO abduction phenomenon with three other people. And when I met those three other people that were in that movie who I'd never met before when the movie was being made, it was the most amazing experience because suddenly I was not alone. There was a woman and two other men, Angela and Emil and Al. And I felt freedom from a lifetime of feeling, knowing I wasn't alone because I saw other abductees throughout my life, but never having anyone to speak to about it. And now I had, there were people, I had a community and I thought this needs to happen for others, you know, because I have this, I wanted others to have it as well. And I know there are other people out there. I know you talked to Les Valdez about his group the other day, and I think that's wonderful. Um, But, you know, for me, from the angle that I'm coming from, and it is more of a little bit of a Christian angle for me, just because that's just my faith, but I don't push that on anyone. Trust me, you know, that has nothing to do with who I talk to and, and everything like that. But just the fact that there just aren't a lot of places for people to go. There aren't teams of people. There aren't support groups. There are starting to be some now. And thank God there are. But that's what inspired it. And so the idea was, can we talk about this? I want it to be okay for people to talk about it. I wanted people to see a normal person talking about these extraordinary things that happened and these extraordinary difficult, extraordinarily difficult things that happened and that it's okay to talk about it. You can get through it. You can heal from it. You can stop it. And you can go on to live a beautiful, wonderful, productive life and that you can do something positive with it instead of you know, just living in the pain of it for your whole life. So, so it's kind of a long answer, but it's a very complicated list of things I would like to get from, you know, I would like to achieve from being able to do this for others, really not so much for myself, but to be able to give back to other people. Yes. No, those, those are some, some great things that you want to do. And yeah, you did mention Les Velez and I had him on the show a while back and, and, you know, he's doing a great thing. Um, Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, having been in the presence of these beings, uh, many times throughout your life, have they ever led on what they're here for, what, what their end game is? Right. Right. You know, it's not like they sit down with us and say, okay, here's our plan. You know, it would be nice if they did, but that's not it because they, you know, they're so they're, they're far advanced of us. They're, they are not human. They are um, beings that are extra interdimensional. They are stronger than us. They are far advanced of us. They are far smarter than us. And for them, we are like lab rats. We are just, they pick us up, use us for what they want. And if we're lucky, they put us back. Um, But what they did with me and what they showed me, showed me what their goal, at least with me was, I was, utilized for experimentation for um part of a breeding program um and i do believe that this that's what the ultimate goal is that they are attempting to create i know the word nephilim is becoming more mainstream and that's that's a good thing because people need to understand what that is a nephilim is just a progeny of a human being and a fallen angelic being or a fallen beneath elohim And that is what I believe these beings to be. Um, And because there are, we know there are beings that are so far advanced of us, but we all have the same creator. And we know that from what I've experienced with them, that they're trying to create these hybrid entities um, across between us and them, something that can fit into our society as easily as you and me. And to create a, you know, 
a larger force of themselves, apart themselves, non-human entities to to carry out whatever their final wishes are. And my thoughts on that are that, you know, if they're here to lead people astray, lead people away from the truth, to make people think that these are benevolent space brothers. And I I just can't buy into that. I can't. Um, and, you know, for someone to say, oh, well, they're good. They're here to help us. You know, you don't kidnap little children and rape women and steal fetuses and, and mutilate cows and humans and tell me that that's a benevolent action. You know, being so far advanced, if you wanted to share information, there are other ways to do that but not by terrorizing little children. And I've talked to so many people who've been just, their lives have just been destroyed from this type of thing. And it's, it's heartbreaking. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> sorry for the answer. Oh no, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly, you know, there's a lot of, uh, heavy things to go along with this phenomena. A lot of things that at least in, in my research of the, of the topic over the years is, uh, something I, I guess sinister about the whole thing, really. Um, yeah. And we can expand more on that later. Um, but uh, in your in your book, um, the next thing I was wondering about is uh, ectogenesis and panspermia. Uh, can you share what these are uh, for listeners out there, and how these ideas might? be tying into this whole alien abduction phenomena. Yes, absolutely. You know, in the book, I take the time to define some terms just so that we're all on the same page. I think a lot of things get uh, misconstrued and a lot of definitions get misconstrued along the way. And we start kind of making up what things are. But panspermia is the idea that we were seeded here either by another intelligence or maybe uh, something that came off a meteor and we all emerged out of the primordial ooze and that kind of thing you know and that is a common belief along some in the ufologist field and and not among others i do not um believe in this panspermia theory um, I believe that we are made by a benevolent creator and that they also have the same creator. And I've been able to prove that when I'm in their presence, because when I call on my creator, they acknowledge him and they leave. And they have very much acknowledged that they're not my creator. They've acknowledged that we were both created by a, a higher power, you know, by our creator. So, so, you know, that in my personal experience, I've been able to wipe that theory off the table. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't respect other people's opinions on that. Everyone's welcome to their opinions, but I, I do not believe that. And like I said, my experience has allowed me to prove that otherwise. Um, the other important, one of the other important definitions I include is ectogenesis because I was part of a program where I was impregnated and the fetus was taken from me at about three to four months. Um, ectogenesis is the process of taking a fetus and bringing it to maturity in an artificial womb. And if you do some research, you'll find out that we have the ability to do that. Artificial wombs have been created. Um, and so for a while, people were like, well, there's no possible way they could take your baby. And then that thing, it would survive. And I'm like, no, it is possible. I've seen it. I've held those babies that were taken from me once they were fully, you know, um, born. Um, and they were so when I would be taken, there was um, a time when I was taken down a hallway. I was had been abducted. I was taken. I get to this hallway, and it's very darkly lit. And the places I was taken were generally in underground-type facilities. And this particular um, event, I was taken into a part of the facility, and it was kind of a blue-red backlit look to it. Um, Everything, like I said, was always very darkly lit when they, where they would take me. And we're going down this hallway. And on either side of it, it's lined with what looks like aquariums. I don't know if you've ever seen like in a pet store where they have the walls of aquariums. It kind of looked like that. Um, and in each one, there was a thing, a fetus of some sort, I'm assuming. And they didn't tell me what they all were, but I could tell that there was there were different stages and they all were hooked up to things. And, you know, it was very creepy. They take me to the end of this hallway lined with these things up above my head. I mean, it was huge. You just have to imagine a massive hallway. 
And then either side of the end of this hallway, and then the hallway leads on to something else beyond there, just a plain hallway. But on either side, there were two doors. And they opened one of the doors, which is a, led to a room that's the size of a large closet. And there was a woman in there. And she was um, doing what I can only describe as imitating childbirth. She was totally into this, getting her baby. And the entities I was with, it was with like a Nordic and a gray. The gray looked female on us. They're, you know, the grays had very, they all look very different, um, just like people do. Anyway, she it handed me a baby, a little tiny baby, and said, this is your baby. It's a good baby. Hold your baby. And I was very happy to get this baby. And I held my baby up to me, and they told me it's my baby. And it didn't respond to me. It was very dark, very red, purple color, very small, um, very large head, very large eyes. Um, and it didn't respond to me. You know, I've had babies and when I held my babies, they cuddled into me and they just, and it was anyone's baby, will a puppy, will a kitten, well, you know, it didn't respond to me. And I was just like, I was so upset. I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong with my baby? And, and they said, um, that I was getting more and more upset. And they're like, okay, you have to go now. I'm like, no, I want my baby. I'm taking my baby. And I got very upset about at that point. And they have the ability to shut you off. So at that point, they just shut me down. And then I woke up in my room and so upset because I had, I could still feel it, you know, like it was still in my hands. I was so upset because I thought I could help this baby. You know, there was something wrong with it. And I knew it wasn't fully human. I could tell that it didn't look like a human baby. But so that's why I bring up the ectogenesis, because that may sound so far out there that someone could take a fetus from you. But I've gone through the process where I've gotten pregnant and it wasn't unusual. I was married at the time or with someone at the time. And I would get to that third or fourth month and I would feel bad, but nothing would happen physically to me at home. And I would have to go into the dog hospital in the middle of the night because my stomach was just in so much pain and there would be no baby. And I had a confirmed pregnancy or in some cases, you know, still testing positive that I was pregnant. So they'd be looking for a baby in my fallopian tubes and do a DNC and there'd be no fetal tissue. This happened over and over again. And since, since I wrote the book, I've talked to so many women who've been through the same thing. Like they say, you know, I go in and the sac is still, the amniotic sac still there. Everything is still there. The only thing that's not there is the fetus. And they're like, we must have, how do you just lose a fetus? You know, everything comes with it when you have a miscarriage, you know, and it, so it doesn't make sense, but it's a common occurrence with women to have this happen, to have these missing pregnancies. Yeah. Yeah. That's a um, rabbit hole there. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, on, on the medical side of things, what what do, do the doctors do? What do they chart yeah. with, with that? Yeah, <laughs> you know, they like see. the baby's, the fetus is is magically gone. Like that's just, you know, it's Don't there's got to be a cover up or something. No, you know, they have explanations. They say, okay. oh, you must have lost it at home and you just didn't know it. And they say this to all of us and we're all just like, um, I wouldn't know if I lost the baby. Yeah. They'll say things like your body absorbed it. Um, they'll say things like you weren't pregnant in the first place. Your doctor made a mistake. I heard a heartbeat. I saw that baby on an ultrasound, you know, still testing positive. They'll say things like hysterical pregnant. You know, they have all kinds of excuses for it because if they can't understand it, there must be a medical reason for it. There's it's never a point of it's something else. Do you know what I mean? They yeah. always just say, or they'll say, well, we don't know what happened. You must have lost it. You know, clearly the baby was there and now it's not. So you lost this baby somewhere along the way, which is true. That baby was taken somewhere along the way, but just against, you know, it wasn't in the ways that they thought. So, so that's usually what happens. And I am telling you, so many of us have had to go through that pain and that sorrow because when you lose a child, it is the most devastating thing for a parent, a man or a woman. And um, we didn't get to mourn those babies. We didn't get to know if they were boys or girls. We didn't get to memorialize them the way we wanted. And, um, and then to be told 
that maybe you weren't pregnant at all. You know, you know, you know when you're pregnant. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's it's one of those things that's been really hard for for me and for the other women I've talked to because everyone wants us to provide more proof, and it's like. <laughs> Our tears not enough, you know. Right. Or what I went through not enough. It was the ultrasound, the sonogram, the heartbeat, all these things. Is it not enough? The positive pregnancy tests. I mean, I would get to the point where when I was first getting pregnant, we didn't have those easy pregnancy tests like you have today, you know, where they were really expensive and whatever. I couldn't afford them. But then there got to a point where I would buy like 10 of those things and just make sure every day that I was still pregnant because I just never I stopped believing it. You know, and I had healthy babies along the way, but just too many missing pregnancies to make sense of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that you have had to go through that. That's, uh, you know, very, uh, a very dark thing to have to, to have to deal with. My gosh. Right. Well, um, right. I'd like to, if, if, uh, you don't mind, I'd like to, to switch so switch gears a, a little bit um, and speak about some important dates um, in uf ufology sure. and how they might be connected to this abduction phenomenon. Uh, Roswell, 1947, that's, you know, mm -hmm. the, the big one that kind of kicked off the modern UFO era and the Grenada tr uh, Treaty of 1954. Um, can you give a brief overview of you know, how these might be connected to this whole thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the reason I bring those up in the book is, you know, I when I wrote the book, I wanted to give a brief overview for my readers who might not be familiar with some of the things that have happened and how it ties back in, in the UFO, in the history of our UFO understanding. Um, and Roswell is an important one because it shows how the government and the powers that be have just worked so hard to cover up and obfuscate the truth from the people of the world. Um, you know, Roswell was so widely viewed by so many. So many people actually saw what happened. So many people experienced what happened. And then they reported it in the newspaper. And then the next day they yanked that story and put out a different story. And my friend Ellie Marzulli has two movies out, part one and part two on Roswell, where he exonerates the families, the, the Jesse Marcel Jr. and his family who were just ridiculed for the, the, the truth that they were trying to share. Um, and where he goes into the debris field and actually finds some things. And I won't I won't give away the farm on that one, but I highly recommend watching because it's really cool what happens when they go into the debris field um, and into the hangar and all that. But, you know, it's one of those where then we come into 2017 and beyond and all of a sudden the government's saying, well, yeah, we actually are studying UFOs. Well, yeah, we actually do have crash craft. We actually do have biologics. We actually do have reverse engineering programs and other companies involved. So it's like they lie and they lie and they lie and they lie. And then they let out little bits of the truth because they have to, because people are starting to see what's happening. I mean, in our modern, more modern era, we communicate so much easier. Everyone's got a phone. Everyone's got a camera. Everyone's got video and things are being shared much more rapidly and much more effectively and efficiently. And it's harder and harder to obfuscate the truth because these beings are out there and they're everywhere. And they're hard to get on camera because you tend to get this UFO brain fog when you see one. Is what LA calls it, and I agree with him. Where it just you don't think straight when when you're around. Like I, when I've seen them, you know, like and there's one time we were at the beach and there was just a ton of these little round orbs and a big round one over off to the side, and all these little ones just went up and eventually they all zoomed into the bigger one and then it just zoomed away and we're all watching it on the beach, hundreds of us. I mean, no one takes a picture or a video because yeah. we're all in a zombified state watching it. And they're like, why didn't I take a picture? Why didn't I take a video? You know, because it has that effect on you. Um, so that's why I bring up Roswell, just to show that, you know, people are talking about this and they're not crazy. And the government's now admitting, yeah, I mean, there's a government report that admits to the missing pregnancies being a part of this. 
There's a government report that admits to. I put in the book um, one of the the name of and a bunch of information from one of these reports that came out that identifies about 100 plus, 180 different problems, symptoms, things that happen when you are um, subjected to these entities and to the ships and everything. And instead of marking off everything that's happened to me off of that list, I had to mark out what didn't happen because only about a cup, a handful of those things hadn't happened to me. Um, burns on the backs of my eyes, you know, things, crazy stuff that doctors can't explain. And, you know, we get crazy radiation type things that happen. So um, that's why I thought Roswell was important. And the Granada Treaty is important because, again, it's it shows that there has been this agreements being made with these entities by our government or off government agencies for almost a hundred years. You know, we're coming up on what 75 years of that. And and before that, I mean, there are government reports from the 1800s of UFOs. So however long they've been in contact with them. Um, and the Granada Treaty, I think, is where they gave permission for them to be able to take people and animals and experiment on them. And um Obviously, I don't think they knew what they were getting into. They didn't realize that these entities were going to lie and that they were going to go ahead and do whatever they wanted. But you have to understand that the supernatural realm, and this is something my friend Vicki Joy Anderson can explain much better than I can, is a very permission-based realm. Permission must be given in order to be taken. Permission must be given by some. And by creating that blanket permission, they got what they wanted, the ability to just take people and do what they wanted. Um, and then I have to revoke that permission, but I didn't know that I had to do that until much later in life. And once I knew that, then I was able to stop them completely. Interesting. From taking. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's like the vampire thing, you know, it, it's like I said, and, and she and I are going to be doing some interviews together because together we can explain this much better because she understands that portion of it and sleep paralysis and all of those things and how that all comes into it. Because, you know, I've spent a lifetime of sleep paralysis and wake, what I call waking paralysis, because when they would come to get me, they would put me into a state of paralysis, but I was wide awake. I was not asleep because the second they show up, I could feel it. I could feel it in the room. I could feel that difference. And then you realize they're there. They don't want you to hurt them because these little grays are quite frail looking. And I think that's why they put, would put me into a state of waking paralysis. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. You definitely hear that a lot with. I don't know, pretty much any abduction experience, people are just, they can't move. They see these things moving around, looking in their face and, and they're just frozen. And that's, yeah. that's probably, at least for me, one of, one of the more disconcerting things, you know, uh, next to them experimenting on you and doing things totally against your will. And it's, yeah, the, the, I mean, the whole thing is just, it's one of my biggest fears growing up, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely something. Um, now, uh, you mentioned earlier you had this near life experience. Uh, would you mind, um, kind of giving a brief overview of, of what, what happened with that? Yeah, sure. Um, and that really did, like I said, have a lot to do with me being able to talk about this and write about this. Um, I was going in for one of the many surgeries I've had. Um, and it was a big one on my spine. They were putting rods and wires and plates and screws in there and stuff because I have all kinds of crazy anomalous things going on that my doctors can't explain. And it wasn't my first surgery with this surgeon. Um, so we were very comfortable with each other. I was taken into the operating room and I had two IV ports in, but I was not hooked up to any machines. It was just me in there on the operating table um, waiting. And there were, you know, the doctor wasn't quite ready. So there were a couple of nurses doing things, two nurses in the room doing things. And um, and another woman comes in. She was either an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist. I don't know which. And she was wearing a white lab coat and leaned over me and she had a pocket full of syringes. She pulled out a syringe and pushed it into my IV port. Remember, I'm not hooked up to monitors or anything yet. And I thought it was a sedative which I was excited for because, you know, 
calms you down, just really relaxing and, you know, usually drift off to sleep. And um, she pushes this into my IV port and turns and walks away, doesn't ask me how I'm feeling, nothing like that. She gave me a paralytic. And at that point, I was fully paralyzed. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. Now, growing up, having constantly been wake paralysis, been in wake paralysis by these beings, I could breathe when they would put me in a state of paralysis. But still, it was so triggering, so um, emotionally just terrifying. But this time I couldn't breathe because I was fully paralyzed. So I couldn't call for help. No one was watching me. No one was paying attention to me. And I died on that table. Um, I heard an audible voice in my head tell me it was okay that I could let go now. And just in the blink of an eye, I was out of my body. I was still me. I still had my personality. I could still see and hear everything that was going on, not just in that room, but in all the rooms around. Um, I felt the most intense love and peace that I have ever felt in my life. I could not describe it to you if I tried. It was so amazing. We don't have anything like it. Um, I just felt at peace and love. I just, I had no worries, no cares. And so then I watched everything that was going on around me. I knew I had to stay close to my body. It's like instinctively I was, you know, stay right here. So I was watching everything. Um, I watched the nurses suddenly discover that I looked funny. One of the nurses came over and said, is she having an allergic reaction? And tried to get my attention. And when I didn't respond, she realized I wasn't breathing and I was dead. And she freaked out. And the other nurse ran to get the doctor. And he came running in the room yelling, bagger, bagger. And um, they put the bag on my face and I didn't respond. And then more people started coming in. And then another, a male, and I never saw the woman who came in and gave me the shot again. Never. A male anesthesiologist came in and intubated me and got me breathing. And then everything went black. That's the last of it. And I uh, woke up in recovery. Um, you know, it took about six hours to do the surgery. I don't know why they went forward with the surgery because I ended up having a stroke from that event. Um, that's why, yeah, this side of my face doesn't move very much. Um, I am now ambidextrous because I learned to use my left side for everything. Um, but I... Um, Woke up in recovery. And usually when I wake up in recovery, because I've had a lot of surgeries, there's a bunch of us in there and just a couple of nurses taking care of a lot of patients. There was like six people around my bed. And every time they tried to bring me out of anesthesia, the pain was so intense. I was screaming and they had to put me back under so I wouldn't stroke out or have a heart attack. Um, about four hours of trying to get me out of anesthesia, I remember praying to God saying, you know, God, either bring me back help me you know i just i didn't want to be in that body that was in so much pain and all of a sudden there were two young orderlies at the foot of my bed and just handsome young orderlies in scrubs and um they i put their hand on my leg just started i calmed down instantly i started talking to them I was like oh you look like you could be my boys oh you're so sweet suddenly i was fine i was calm i mean the pain was still there but i was okay they were able to stabilize me, get me out of recovery. And as they're taking me up to my room, I'm still talking to these young men. And we get to the ICU room um, where my husband and my daughter-in-law are waiting outside the room for me. And I grab their hands. I'm like, you have to meet the boys. They look like it could be two of our kids. I have a lot of kids. Some are mine. Some are kids that call me mom. A lot of kids call me mom. <laughs> I'm everyone's mom. Um, and uh, they're like, okay, where are they? And they're right here at the foot of the bed. And they weren't there. And... I asked the nurse and the other orderly, I said, where did the boys go? And she's like, honey, what boys? I'm like, the two boys, they were with us in the elevator, down the hall. The ones I was talking to, she's like, we wondered who you were talking to, honey. It's just been the two of us the whole time. I don't know who you're talking about. No one else saw them but me. I searched that hospital for those young men and they, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have ID. I think that these were benevolent angelic beings who just came to help me through that experience. And I, I like to share that story because I want people to know there are good, beautiful, loving, benevolent, angelic beings. And when you have an experience with them, that's what it's like. They don't take anything from you. They don't hurt you. They don't interfere and they don't stick around when they're done. They're done. And it was just the most beautiful experience. And it, it was, you know, the only way I got through that, through that experience. And I yeah. believe that those benevolent, good angelic beings. So having been in 
the presence of both, you can feel the difference. You know right away, you know, that and and a, a fallen being, an evil being, for lack of a better word, is not going to tell you that it's evil. It's going to tell you it's good so that it can get whatever it is that it wants, right? The same as if someone's trying to take advantage of you in some way. People don't come up and say, hey, I'm a grifter or I'm a con artist or I'm a carjacker, you know, yeah. they they want to trick you into, you know, giving them your money, your car, your wallet, whatever. And that's how these other beings are too. You know, they may be telling a lot of people, hey, we're your ancestral cedars. Hey, we're here to save the world. Hey, we're here to take you off planet and help you to become enlightened. But that's not the truth. And I warn people to be very cautious. Don't call on these things because you don't know what you're going to get. And we're not supposed to be calling on them. They are far advanced of us. And the only way that we can save ourselves and be protected from them is because we have the same creator. And because when we call on our creator, they know that we have the same creator and they know that our creator will protect us from them. And they know that they have to back down. And I have watched them do it. And I have watched other people do it. And this truth it rings true. You don't have to be a religious fanatic. You don't have to be like people call a Bible banging person. You don't have to be anything except know in your heart that our creator loves you and that he wants to help you and save you. That's all. God will take it from there. And he'll help you from there and work with you and be with you from there. And, you know, when I wasn't with following my path, when I wasn't living a life that I really should have been living, God never left me. He still loved me. He still protected me. He was still there with me, waiting for me, you know, and that's, that's an important part of the message I want to share with people is that it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to put up with this. You don't have to put up with them taking me. Um, and those benevolent, beautiful, wonderful angelic beings are out there too. And that's what I want for everyone. Not, not the ugliness of being abducted against your will. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm familiar with, you know, the, the schools of thought on both ends, you know, these entities are ben benevolent or maybe they're malevolent or even ambivalent towards humanity. And some people right. think that there are, these are our space brothers and sisters. They want to help us ascend to a new frequency, the fifth dimension, that kind of thing. But, um, clearly based on your experience, whoever these entities are, don't really have that in mind. Do you think there are other, uh, other races or civilizations out there? You know, you hear that there's several different types of, of alien beings and, you know, some people have theories that they might be at odds with each other. I, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there are a lot of theories out there and people like to create a lot of theories or round bits and pieces of information they're getting from here and there, or maybe they're channeling something. Um, first of all, you can't trust anything that you channel necessarily. Cause like I said, an evil being is not going to tell you it's evil. It's not going to tell you it's lying. So you don't have any way to really know for sure. Um, secondly, yes, there are other types of entities out there, tons of them, lots of different kinds, like the grays, the little grays that would come to take me. They, I believe are like a meat suit, like an avatar type body, um, because they don't have a mouth that opens. They don't have any vis any visible external organs like male, female. They don't seem, they're very thin, very frail, very small. Their eyes are black like screens and they don't move. They're just static. Um, and they seem, they have this evil, evil presence to them. I believe that they're an avatar and I believe that they're housed by, they could be housed by another entity. They could be housed by AI. They could be housed by a demonic entity or demon. Um, we know from extra biblical texts, from ancient texts, from the Bible, from all kinds of texts from all over the world and different belief systems that demon demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, which are the progeny of, of human and angelic beings. Um, and that's what I think is in most of them, at least the ones that I was in the presence of. But there are gray, the other types of grays that I think these were fashioned after because i've seen those empty too those grays and i know others have as well um they were fashioned after the regular grays which have eyes that move and 
foreheads that wrinkle and they have facial expressions and they look different. Some are taller, some are bigger, some are smaller, some look more female than male. You know, they they wear what looks like skin tight outfits as opposed to just the gray skin. And the little grays smell bad sometimes, by the way, too. They have a terrible odor to them, um, some of them. Um, they, you know, so they're clearly different. Their eyes move. Um, yeah, they have like these black eyes that are just freakishly almond shaped black eyes, but they do move. Um, there are the reptilian, like lizard looking type entities, which my handler was one. Um, there are the Nordic types that look very almost human, but their eyes are like twice the size of ours. And, you know, their hair is almost like a translucent. They're very thin, very uh, different. Um, then there, I've seen the insect, insectolin types that look kind of like a praying mantis triangly face, a very long, freakish kind of hook hands and arms and things. Um, so there are lots of different kinds. And we know from ancient texts that through all different cultures that these types of entities have, you know, very different types of them and have existed throughout time. And, and so um, we don't know where they're from, you know, for someone to say live on a specific planet, where does that come from? You know, who says who, I mean, I've experienced them in underground facilities. I think they're extra dimensional. I think they can pop in and out of our dimensions. Um, obviously, as I said, I think they're much stronger, smarter, and they're not built for our earth. You know, we tend to try to put everything in this little box that fits into, we live on planet earth and everyone else is like us and we're the apex predator and we're the only one that exists. And that's not true. And they're not designed to live here on our earth. They are designed to live outside of this. And we're not familiar with all of those realms and those vibrations and those different dimensions and things. So for us to be able to speak intelligently on it is almost impossible. Um, and far outside of our grasp. Yeah. Frankly. Yeah. Well, are these uh, underground facilities that you, you talk, you've mentioned a couple of times now uh, they're on earth. They're not somewhere yeah. else. Okay. I just mm -hmm. wanted to clarify yeah. that. Um, you know, you as far as I know, I mean, if I was taken somewhere else, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, and the times that I was here, you know, on earth. Um, and I went in elevators that went just down and down and down. And when I was little, I also went on what I called the sideways elevators, which went back and forth or sometimes at an angle up or an angle down, which I now realize were probably high speed trains. But, you know, when I was little, I didn't have vocabulary for that, but they had benches with, you know, and they were silent. And when I was little growing up, transportation was not quiet. You know, yeah. we didn't have a lot it was very loud yep. so for like an elevator again um and um so and if you think about how deep our oceans are you know the mariana trench and there's a cavern in the atlantic ocean that i think is something like twenty five thousand feet deep and how many empire state buildings you could fit in there now think about what could be under our feet we already know that there are deep underground military bases what we don't know is exactly you know we haven't been given the information as to exactly what's under there what i experienced were massive facilities i mean you take a football field and an airport and everything like that and you put them all together and that's the size of one big holding room where we would come into and i would be watching tons of other abductees and we're all walking because we know we're like in zombie states and being led around or know where we're supposed to go or what have you depending on where we were and who we were with um and then just these mazes of hallways and stairways and elevators and places i mean you would get totally lost in there if you didn't oh. have some telling you where to go that's how massive these facilities are did i know if i was underground or underwater no idea did i know if i could have been taken off planet no idea but i could breathe wherever i was so that kind of is a clue that you know and there were humans there working alongside them all these different types of non-human entities um there were other abductees and there were people working you know so um and these people were you know i know that they probably didn't know what they were getting into when they took that job i mean if you think about someone in, with you doing a government job or you're doing a job for some kind of aerospace company or something like that and they say hey you just got this new secret clearance and we're going to put you on this great new project what do you think yeah great i love it you know more money more security fun top secret project 
sign your NDAs, they take you there and then you're in it and you can't talk about it. Yeah. And they utilized me and they utilized other abductees in very ugly ways to show people what would happen to them, to their wives, to their daughters, to their friends, to their family members, if they talk. Um, and that's the real ugliness of it is the fact that our government knows that they're putting people in these programs or whoever the companies are, they're doing this. And they're, then they're threatening people that if you talk, this is going to happen, you know? It's, it's ugly. It's, yeah. it's, those people couldn't help me. They weren't allowed to talk to me. I wasn't allowed to talk to them. And I understand why they couldn't, you know, I don't like it, but I understand it. Right. You know, I would like my own family. Of course. Of course. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a, <laughs> it's a big, big topic for sure. It is. Um, it's the time of it. And, yeah. you know, to, to drill down into any one area, we could spend three hours and, you know, I'm certainly happy to come back if you are. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I know we are, we're, we're running, we're getting close to the clock here, but, um, there are a few more things I, I, uh, wanted to touch on, um, yeah. you know, circling back to your experiences as a child, um, mm -hmm. why are people, why do you think people are targeted at such a young age? age and is there something generational going on with this is there like are there family lines where people are affected by this thing definitely yes there definitely are family lines and lineages that are affected by this for a number of different reasons um i'll start with why children are are targeted on this if you take a child from a very young age and you start abducting putting them into this scenario this abduction scenario you can groom that child from a very young age to then be a part of this program. I was Stockholm syndrome to the nines in this program. I had capture bonding, you know, Stockholm syndrome with my handler. I bought into this. I did not feel like there was any other choice because from a very young age, I was groomed to be this person in this program and taught that this was my life and this was how it was going to be. And this is how I was going to act and react there and out in my normal day-to-day -day life. And so when you get a young child, just like they groom and traffic children and other things and sex in the sex trade and other things like that today, it's no different. Um, you know, children are treated as disposable items in our communities and our world. And it's horrifying, but it's no different. Um, I think the reason it does run in families, I think when they find a genetic lineage that works for them, uh, I'm an O negative and I come from a Masonic family background and from a royal background and all of those things. I think, you know, it can be someone's given permission. Um, oftentimes you find that in these Masonic groups. I'm not saying everyone in a Masonic group does that. No, some, some of those groups and some of those people are really amazing and wonderful and loving people, but not all. And, you know, there is a lot around that. Um, sometime, you know, so someone gives permission somewhere along the way. Um, once they find a genetic line that works for them, where they can utilize your genetic material, whether it's for breeding, whether it's for whatever it is that they want, um, then they want to keep working within that family line. Because chances are one of your children is going to have that same. And I had a child who had, that, who was, had the same blood type as me and that they were utilizing that child as well. Yes, when I found out, I was horrified. And that was also what helped me to figure out how to stop this. I could deal with it for me. But if you touch my children, I will come for you. And I will not stop until you are not harming my child. And that's that was a huge, huge part of it for me. No one hurts my children, period. End of story. Um, so, you know, I think that's why it really runs in families. It doesn't, it, it, just it's genetics and sometimes it's permissions and sometimes it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of different things, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You've mentioned this handler a few times. Um, who was this handler? What was, what was its deal? Yeah. I had an entity who was with me from my earliest memories. I don't remember a time when he wasn't there. It was a male. He appeared human, kind of a military, real square jawed, clean cut military, sometimes in fatigues, tucked into boots type military. You know, um, 
a lot of us who've had these handlers uh, since found out it's a very common thing. There, it's someone who's with me my whole lifetime of being abducted. Always told me, you know, was there to help me figure out where to go, what was going to happen, you know, um, just where, you know, what was going on for that particular abduction experience if I was in a specific place. Um, so not every time he was there. Um, but when he was there, it was definitely at that was where I was getting that Stockholm syndrome type relationship. Because, you know, when you're when you're being taken or kidnapped, you oftentimes your captor is the one who provides you with food and shelter and clothing and water and whatever your needs are. And you create this this yeah, you know, unhealthy relationship, dependency, codependency on them. So he um that relationship, yeah, was was throughout my life. He became um, an, a more intimate relationship as I got older, and um, and he, I felt very comfortable and close with him. And I asked him to show me what he looked like because I could tell sometimes he would fuzz out, and I could see something else behind what looked like human. And so that's when I realized he was a reptilian, and he was beautiful. He was not this ugly, creepy reptilian looking thing that you might find pictures of on the internet or something. He was beautiful. He was beautiful. His skin was just like opalescent and, sh and just almost like red and blue and green, almost jewel like sometimes it just, he was beautiful. So he wasn't gross or scary or anything, but and maybe that's just because I was used to him. Maybe that's because I had that relationship with him. I don't know. Um, I don't have any desire to be around him today. The last time he tried to um, contact me and tried to get me to come back. He said he was sick and he looked very, very, very sick. He looked like just a flat matte green color. It was almost a brown green. And I don't, I don't know if that was to, to, you know, be deceptive to me to try to get me to agree to something. I don't know, but I stood my ground. Like, I was, hell no, you know, I'm not doing that. No way. Um, yeah, so that, but that is something that a lot of other abductees have experienced as well, having, having kind of a hand or there to just keep you in line, keep you where you're supposed to go, teach you what you need to learn, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah. it, it makes sense that there would be a point of contact or, or somebody to help, uh, yeah. normalize a situation that's so you know, for lack of a better term, alien of s things going on that are beyond your control. Um, mm -hmm. and that's just, it's, it's very interesting, um, to learn about that, that aspect of it. I had not really known yeah. that that was part of it. Yeah. It's what's interesting is when you start to talk to actual abductees and there, are, there are some of us out, out there and that's what I do almost every day. Then you start to find out these things like this that are common threads between all of us, because there are a lot of ufologists and a lot of amazing people doing amazing research and work and have spent decades in it. And I appreciate them and I applaud them for their work. But when you start talking to those of us who've been through this and who have been there, then you start to find out these other parts that don't come up on the, because it's not something everyone concentrates on. You know, there's just, they're kind of concentrating on some of the main bigger points of it. And I get that, but you're, but yeah, to your point, yeah, it's, there are a lot of things that most people don't realize go on in this because it is a very well organized, very intricate program where it is very well thought out and very well organized. And we are in it for life, you know, as far as they're concerned, because if we're not, then what's going to happen, we're going to start talking like I am. And yes, I've been threatened. And yes, I've had a lot of problems and yes, they've come after me, but it's not going to stop me because I know I'm protected by a higher power. And ultimately this is going to do more good than the harm that they can try to do to me. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, I'd love to get your uh, perspective before we close out here on, you know, recent developments in the news uh, regarding disclosure. Like last year um, there was that the whistleblower, David Grush, who was involved in the congressional hearing along with some other high profile uh, people who whistleblowed some uh, events within the military uh, like David Fravor um, and 
do you think there's going to be any big new developments this year or within the next five years? You know, that is, yeah, that is a hard question to answer because I don't have the ability to see, you know, into the yeah, future. Of course. <laughs> Here's what I think. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, allergy season here in Texas. Um, I think that it is he, this, this topic is heating up. And I don't think that they would allow as much to come out because trust me, if they didn't want David Grish to talk, he would not have talked. Okay. He's only talking because someone has allowed it. They don't want full disclosure out there because they would have the powers that be, the people involved would have to admit to the fact that they've been involved in this from the get-go, that humans are involved in the heinous crimes that are happening against people and animals. But the fact that, that since 2017 and the New York Times article broke and then Commander David Fraber was on Tucker Carlson and then we've had the whistleblowers like David Grush come forward. The fact that they're allowing these things to come out means that there is more and more confirmation that's going to be coming out. Um, I don't think that we'll ever have any type of full disclosure, but I do think there will be a continued confirmation of what's happening. Um, and the rate at which that happens, I think that has to do with what is happening in the spiritual realm. I really do. Because these things are interdimensional, you know, and even our government agencies are admitting to the fact that they're interdimensional. They're saying that, you know, they, they let go of some information about the grays that fits exactly into everything I've written about, talked about with grays, that they had no lymph or digestive systems. I'm like, that's what I'm saying. You know? Right. Yes. They're, they're yeah, biomechanical so androids or something like that yeah. <laughs> you can make skin in a lab you yeah. know and they're so far advanced but so i think that you know what's going to come out is going to be a combination of what they have to let out because people are seeing and experiencing more things it's going to be what they let out because they have another agenda and it's going to further whatever agenda they have um and then you know i think the third thing is going to be whatever comes out will be completely out of everyone else's control because if these entities decide to show up, no one's going to be able to do anything about it. Right. You know, when that wild wide craft shows up over someone's house, everyone's going to see it and there's nothing that they can do to cover that up anymore. Not the way people are sharing information. So the world has changed and they have to change with it. So those are my thoughts on disclosure. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, thank you for your perspective. Um, <laughs> now, uh, I guess one final closing thought here that I have is, you know, as, as an experiencer yourself, if someone else out there who has gone through something similar, who is listening, you know, with this alien abduction phenomenon, uh, or someone who might be reading your book, do you have any advice on, for them on where to go to find support? Um, well, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, if you have experienced this, just know you're not alone, first of all. Second of all, you know, there are a couple of support groups out there. I don't have any listed on my website because I have not fully vetted them yet. But do your homework. Vet the groups that are out there. You can contact me on my website. Send me a message. Send me a, it goes to my email. And I will read it and I will get back to you. It's not always right away because I get a lot of messages. So please be patient with me, but you can contact me and I will be happy to talk to you or just listen, or we can just email back and forth and you can share your experiences. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. People send me instant messages that way all the time, or messages that way all the time, direct messages. Um, you know, it's, I have to plow through a lot of <laughs> junk to get to the real messages that people send me. So just be patient. And that's why I say the easiest way to contact me is through, through my website, through that email. Um, and, um, yeah, just don't give up hope. You're not alone. You're not crazy. This stuff is real. It's happening to real people all over the place every day, all over the world. It doesn't care who you are, what your gender or your nationality or your race or your preferences are. They don't care. It's just happening to everyone everywhere. And it's it's unfortunate, but there are people you can talk to. There are people who believe you and there are ways to stop it. And that would be my message to anyone out there who needs help. And please don't hesitate to get in touch with me via my website, which is KarenWilkinsonAuthor.com. And I'll give you all of that for the show notes as well. Yes, of course, of course. Oh, and... Um... I, I'm guessing, uh, but uh, uh, the best place to pick up your your book is 
the website as well? Or um, LAMarzuli.net. It yes. is exclusively for sale at LAMarzuli.net. So don't go to Amazon or anywhere like that. It's not on there yet. It's just at LAMarzuli.net exclusively. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. LAMarzuli.net. You can connect that, yes, through my website. So if you're not sure where to go, just look up my name, Karen Wilkinson with eyes, author.com. Um, or find me on Facebook under my name or Instagram under my name, Karen Wilkinson or Karen Wilkinson author. And all those links will be there as well. So I try to make it as easy as possible for everyone to find me um, and to get a hold of me. So, um, and looks like just reach out and yes, please, you know, I would be so grateful if, if you wanted to get the book and support me in that way um, and uh, help me get this message out and share this message with others. Great. Well, this has been a, a, a truly fascinating conversation today, Karen. Thank you so much for being on and uh, we hope to hear from you soon. And yes, absolutely. Uh, hope you have you. a, yeah, be well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, be blessed. Be well. Thank you. Thanks again to Karen for coming on the show today. Her story is shared by so many others out there who say that they have been taken by some intelligence that is not human. So it really makes you wonder what's really going on out there and to what end. Perhaps someday we'll find out, but for now we can only speculate. As always, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone out there who checks out my show. Those of you who download it, share it with friends and family around social media. It really helps the show out a ton when you do that. The Strangeology podcast really wouldn't be possible without the support of listeners like you. And if you're looking for a way to support the show and what I'm doing here, you can always check out my Patreon, which you can join for as little as $1 per month. I've got a number of different tiers with increasing benefits. You get things like shout outs, early access to episodes, along with access to the ad free version of the show and Strangeology Beyond, which is the members only episode extension, which is sometimes a whole episode in and of itself beyond the normal topic of the main show. There's also merch discounts to my Etsy shop, exclusive merch, voting power for topics that I will research and cover. And there's even a t-shirt of the month club. If you enjoy my home state cryptids collection, you get a new shirt every month and I've got dozens of different designs. So it's a good time and you should definitely check it out. And speaking of shout outs, I'm going to give a quick shout out to all current members of the Patreon. Shout out to Alex Chad from Appalachian Huntsman, Mike, Sean C, Miranda, John, Maureen, Gail, Adam, Ryan, Angie, Daniel from Blue Room Insight, Easton Hawk, Guy, Megan, Jeff from Map and Black, Into the Wildwood, Miguel, Albert, Nicole, Shane from Inquiries of Our Reality, Britt, Lene, Carlos B, Son of the Wolf, Zach A, Laura, Zach S, Scott, Larry, Ivan, Chris K, Kurt, Chris J, Brandon, Carlos S, Michelle, and Barbara. You all rule, and thank you all so much for your continued support. It helps the show, and it means the world to me. And one more time, if you want to join this ever-growing community of fellow lovers of the Fortean, the strange, the weird, the unexplained, head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. To any advertisers or companies out there looking to collaborate with the Strangeology podcast, or if you are an author, researcher, experiencer, and would like to be considered for an interview on the show, please send all business inquiries to info at strangeology.com. And one more time, make sure to give me a follow over on all my social media accounts. You can find me again on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, X, and Threads. If you're ever looking for more content from me or want to know what I'm up to, definitely check that out. 
Occasionally, I also host merch giveaways over on my Instagram, so you'll definitely want to follow me there. All the links will be in the show notes. And if you're looking for another way to support the show, I also have merch. So I'm hoping this year to launch my own standalone store. It's kind of been a back burner project for a while, but for now, you can head on over to my Etsy shop at strangeology.etsy.com, where I have a whole assortment of cryptid, alien, and otherwise Fordian gear that is available, and I'm frequently adding in new designs, so you'll want to check back often. You can purchase items like t-shirts, hoodies, tank tops, which warmer weather is coming, so you're probably going to want to rock some cryptid tanks. And I've also got stickers, magnets, prints, mugs, enamel pins, and more. I'm probably forgetting some stuff. I'm also hoping to add some embroidered patches and more enamel pin designs this year, so be on the lookout for those. Again, the link is strangeology.etsy.com. All right, I think that's all from me for now. I'm going to take a quick break here. Normally on episodes where I have a guest, they're able to stick around for a few extra minutes, but unfortunately, Karen's time was limited on the day we recorded. So after the break, Strangeology Beyond is actually going to be about a very curious and ongoing alien abduction case. That is the tale of David Huggins. It's both a terrifying case with its implications, but also equally fascinating. You won't want to miss it. Patrons, stick with me and for everyone else. Until the next time, take care of yourselves and each other and keep it strange. Welcome to another installment of Strangeology Beyond, your exclusive portion of the show. Unfortunately,